welcome back to Church Crime Time Tuesdays. I am your host, Lacey Bean, and let's jump into another episode. How can a man assassinate someone? They find the murder weapon. The murder weapon has this man's fingerprint on it, and it still takes over 30 years for the man to be convicted of his crime. Well, when you find out that the crime had taken place during the days of desegregation, you realize that the answer is racism. If you have followed me on social media for any length of time in the last at least year or so, then you understand that I have been deconstructing my faith. And with that, I have been decolonizing. I, like many of you, um, especially raised in the South, were raised being taught a version of our history that is extremely whitewashed, to say the least. Not only is our history of America whitewashed, but so is our faith, and they intermingle and they connect in so many different ways. It's, it's heartbreaking, honestly. But these stories have been swept under the rug too many times and for far too long, so today I'm bringing you one of those stories. Now, where I first heard about this case was a book called White Too Long. Now, as I've been decolonizing, I have been making it a point to get my information from people of color, listening to their stories, listening to their history, and really just listening to them, but making sure that I'm getting my information from people of color. Well, the book White Too Long is actually written by a white man, and I made an exception to that because this book specifically talks about how racism and white supremacy are connected with Christianity and breaks it down. And I think anybody who identifies themselves as a Christian needs to read this book. Here is a picture of the book. I will also be linking it in the description box below. Make sure you go ahead and go get your copy. You can get it from Amazon or even on Audible and listen to it while you do dishes or clean your house. This is not a sponsored video, but Audible, if you're listening, um, Hmm. So today we're going to be talking about the case of Medgar Evers. Medgar was born on July 2nd, 1925 in Decatur, Mississippi. He was the third of five children and their family actually owned a small farm and the dad even worked at a small, small sawmill. Now, in order for the children to get any kind of education, schools were segregated in those days. So all of him and his siblings had to walk. I want you to picture this. Try to imagine what this would be like. They had to walk 12 miles, just one way, 12 miles to get to school and then 12 miles back. So next time you're in your car, I want you to like redo your meter, whatever that is, mile counter, meter, whatever it's called, redo it and drive. And then when you hit 12 miles, imagine having to walk that distance from your home every single day just to get an education because they couldn't go to schools that were closer because they were for white people. Now, when Medgar graduated, he ended up joining the army and he served from 1943 to 1945. He fought in the Battle of Normandy and at the end of the war, Medgar was honorably discharged as a sergeant. Then in 1948, Medgar ended up applying and attending Alcone Agricultural and Mechanical College. I know it's a long one. Um, and he studied for business administration. Now, Medgar was very active in college. He played on the football team, he did debate, he was on the track team, um, he even sang in the choir, and he was even the junior class president. He ended up earning his Bachelor's of Arts in 1952. While he was in college, he ended up meeting a beautiful young lady named Merle Beasley. They hit it off, they fell in love very quickly, and they ended up actually getting married while Medgar was still in college. He ended up marrying on December 24th, 1951, the year prior to Medgar graduating. Yes, they were married on Christmas Eve. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> Together, they ended up having three children. They had a daughter named Rihanna and two sons, one named James and one named Daryl. The couple ended up moving to a town called Mount Bowie, Mississippi. This was a town that was established by African Americans and they felt at home because of course they wanted to be around people where they felt welcome and loved of course and that is where they started to establish their family. During this time, Medgar was actually an insurance salesman and then later on Medgar was actually the president of the regional council 
of Negro leadership. I think that's how you say it. Now, while he was president within this organization, what he would do is he would help um, establish and organize boycotts. Specifically, he did a lot of boycotts for gas stations because gas stations were very known for not even letting people of color use their restrooms. So he would organize boycotts of these gas stations. Just a few years into his work in civil rights, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling was passed. Now, if you are not familiar with that is, let me explain. So 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling ruled that it was in unconstitutional, not unconstitutional, unconstitutional to have segregated schools, meaning at this point, schools started to desegregate. After this ruling, Medgar actually tried to apply to the state funded University of Mississippi Law School, and he was actually denied. Even though the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling had already passed, it took a long time for schools and places to actually start desegregating. And yes, Medgar was rejected from the University of Mississippi Law School based solely on his race. Now, the response to the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling was that the white people decided to come together and establish the White Citizens Council within Mississippi. It didn't take long for branches of this organization to pop up all across Mississippi. And what was this organization's plan or mission? To stop desegregation. Literally, that was their entire mission. That same year, on November 24th, 1954, Medgar was announced that he was actually one of the very first field secretaries for the NAACP within Mississippi. Now, the NAACP is very well known. They have been established for a long time. I think they were first established in the 1920s. Now, if you don't know what the NAACP is, it stands for the National Association of Advancement of Colored People. That's a mouthful. So we're going to be talking about that. We're gonna be saying the NAACP. Now their mission was to fight for equal rights for the African-American population. One of the things that they fought for during this time was voting rights. It didn't take long for Medgar to become a very prominent leader within the civil rights movement, and with that came a lot of trouble. It literally put just a target on Medgar's back because white supremacist groups were not happy with desegregation or any kind of civil rights movements. So much so that Medgar actually had some attacks on him and his home. On May 28th of 1963, a Molotov cocktail was thrown into the garage area of Medgar's home. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. But then, not long later, on June 7th of 1963, when Medgar was coming out of an NAACP meeting, somebody tried to run him over with their car. Now, because of all of the targets against him and his family, him and his wife, Merle, had to actually start training their children on what to do in case of a bombing or a shooting or how to respond in one of those situations. I can't imagine how that would be growing up and having to sit there listening to your parents teach you how to respond just in case somebody wants to kill or attempts to kill your family or bomb your house or shoot up your house like Wow, can we say traumatic? Now, during this time, after the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, churches were furious. So much so that in the 1956 legislative, they tried to pass a law saying that if a church tried to desegregate, that they could lose their tax exempt status. Now, thankfully, this bill didn't pass the Senate and the House, and now thankfully, this bill ended up failing and didn't pass through the Senate and the House, but they didn't stop there. Just four years later, in 1960, the Mississippi legislature ended up introducing a bill called the Church Property Bill. Now, what this bill was designed to do was before this time, if a church denomination, if their parent denomination decided to cut ties with them or vice versa, the state of Mississippi's laws stated that that denomination had to return all property to the parent denomination. So church property, buildings, anything like that had to be returned to the parent denomination. But with this bill, it said that if a parent denomination tried to start desegregating and a local chapter wanted to disconnect from the parent denomination because of desegregation laws, they could keep and hold on to all of their property. One of the writers of this bill actually said, quote, when integration finally comes to Mississippi, it will come through the front doors of the churches in the disguise of religion. Wow. Unfortunately, this bill ended up passing 
very comfortably too. It went through the Senate with a 29 to 10 vote. And then when it went through the House, it was an 87 to 13 vote. On Sunday, June 9th of 1963, Four students got together with Medgar Evers and Reverend Ed King. They came up with an idea of trying to cross the color line when it came to churches in the area. Their plan was for the four students who were people of color to go to two different churches. The first church that they were going to go to was the First Baptist Church, which is actually the largest Baptist church within Mississippi. And they were going to try to enter the congregation and attend their worship service on Sunday morning. If they were unable to attend the worship service at the Baptist church, they were then going to try to go to the largest Methodist church within the area called Galloway United Methodist Church, which was actually just down the road. So that Sunday morning, Medgar picked up the students and drove them himself to the First Baptist Church. When the students arrived at the First Baptist Church, they were met at the steps of the church by one of the deacons and the deacon said that they were unable to come in and attend the worship service because he said that if they were to come in, then they would be disrupting their worship service and he couldn't allow that. Now he used the words disrupting the worship service on purpose. A law had passed within Mississippi stating that it was illegal for somebody to disrupt a worship service. So by him saying that they were going to be disrupting the worship service, the students knew that that meant if you try to continue to come in, we're going to call the cops on you and you're going to get arrested. While the students were sitting there on the steps of the First Baptist Church, the governor of Mississippi actually attended that church and he arrived and walked into church service during the time that the students were there talking with the deacon and never said a word. Well, the students knew they weren't gonna be able to get in and so they left the First Baptist Church, went down the street to Galloway United Methodist Church and unfortunately they were met with a very similar situation. An usher met the students on the steps of the church and turned them away as well. So even though, de de so even though desegregation had started to take place, it was being pushed back right and left and especially from churches. Now, even though both churches had a very similar response, how they reacted to these situations was actually very different. So the First Baptist Church actually had a meeting right after church that day where they doubled down on their actions of turning away African Americans from their worship services. This was a deacon's meeting and in this meeting they started to put together a resolution backing what they did. Now this resolution passed in this meeting unanimously and the church even came out making a statement that said, quote, the FBC, First Baptist Church, would confine its assemblies and fellowship to those other than the Negro race. But at the Galloway United Methodist Church, a very different response happened. Even though there were many members of Galloway United Methodist Church that were pro-segregation, including the mayor, the senior reverend didn't agree. That day during worship, halfway through, he was approached and informed about what had happened outside their church and how African Americans were turned away from entering their worship service. Reverend Dr. W.B. Shewa stood up at church that day, gave a small sermon on the Spirit of Christ, and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a prepared statement. This was a statement that he had wrote weeks prior and had been carrying it around for such a time as this. He read out this statement, which was actually his resignation. Reverend Dr. W.B. Shayla had been very outspoken on how there cannot be a color line in a Christian church. And he had spoken about this time and time again. So when he was informed that black worshipers were being turned away from his church, he knew that he could not continue preaching in a church where segregation was taking place. The associate minister of the church also followed suit and resigned as well. A few days later, Reverend King and Medgar Evers ended up having a meeting at an all African American Methodist church where they wanted to talk about what had happened and kind of figure out a way of moving forward. During this meeting, Medgar stated that he knew that many, many, many people in both congregations were pro-segregation, but he was so touched by two pastors 
resigning just because black worshipers were turned away from their services. He stated, what they said, what they did, refusing to preach in a segregated church, now that has made me feel better than anything in this whole movement in many days. Reverend King left this meeting and told Medgar that he would see him at the office on Monday. Unfortunately, that was the last time Reverend King would see Medgar's alive. Medgar stayed at the church to continue working and he stayed for many hours. When he decided to return home, he didn't return home until late that night. It was actually past midnight leading into the next day. So this was June 12th of 1963. Medgar pulls into his home, parks in his driveway, leans over in his car, grabs a pile of t-shirts that were from the NAACP. The t-shirts said, Jim Crow must go got out of the car and started to walk to his front door. Just shortly after walking away from his car, a bullet struck him in the back, piercing his heart. Somehow, miraculously, Medgar was able to stand up and stumble to his front door where he collapsed. Now, it wasn't strange for Medgar to come home really late, work really long hours, or even be traveling during this time. So when he got home, his children were still awake because they wanted to see their dad because they didn't see him very often because of all of the civil rights work that he would do. Now the kids were inside and they heard the shot. Because they had been trained for situations like this, Merle got the kids, told them to go to the bathroom, hide in the bathtub, and don't come out. Merle then went outside, finding her husband shot and passed out on their front porch. Merle then got Medgar and rushed him to the nearest hospital. At first, Medgar was actually denied entry because this was an all-white hospital. Merle sat there and told them who Medgar was and his civil rights activism and everything and how prominent he was known within the community and they actually let him enter surprisingly but unfortunately 50 minutes later Medgar was pronounced dead. Also surprisingly Medgar was the first black person to be allowed entry into this hospital. Like I said before Medgar was a very prominent leader within the civil rights movement and this gave him a huge target on his back from white supremacist groups including especially the KKK. Now because of this, Medgar actually had around the clock supervision and protection from the FBI and local police. Anytime Medgar would be driving home or going to the office or his civil rights, you know, things and organizations, police or the FBI were supposed to be following him to give him protection. But surprisingly, that night he came home with no protection or escort from the FBI or local police. It is speculated that there were members of the police force and the FBI at the time that were involved in the KKK, but that is speculation. Nothing has been proven or disproven when it comes to that allegation. Now, Medgar's funeral was a week later on June 19th. He was buried at Arlington Memorial Cemetery, and at his funeral, it was stated that over 3,000 people attended. At his funeral, he also received full honors from the military. Now, naturally, after this murder, it didn't take long for police to start doing an investigation, and very quickly, they ended up finding a rifle with a scope abandoned in a field not far from Medgar's house. When they took the gun into evidence and started, you know, investigating it, they ended up recovering a print off the scope of the rifle. Who did this print belong to? None other than a man named Byron De La Beckwith Jr. Now, who is Byron and what led him to assassinate Medgar? Byron De La Beckwith Jr. was born in Klaus, California. Unfortunately, Byron's dad actually ended up dying when he was five from pneumonia. Him and his mom ended up moving to Greenwood, Mississippi, but Byron's mom ended up getting cancer and died when he was 12. Byron was then raised by his aunt and uncle, which probably worked in his favor because he was actually able to attend a very prestigious prep school called Bell Buckle within Tennessee. It doesn't do him any good later in life because he murders someone, but anyways. Byron ends up graduating and then in 1942, he ends up joining the Marines where he is a machine gunner and he actually serves and fights in World War II. Unfortunately, during his time during in war, he was shot in his side and ended up being honorably discharged in 1945. 
After Byron is discharged from the military, he moves all the way over to Rhode Island where he ends up meeting his first wife, Mary Louise Williams. They end up moving to Greenwood, Mississippi where Byron ended up growing up. And that is where they started their life together. They ended up having a son, but their marriage didn't work out and they ended up getting a divorce. Byron does end up remarrying and moving on with life. To earn money, Byron was a salesman. He sold things like fertilizer, tobacco, and many other things. Well, Byron was like any other white man during that time. And when the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling went through, Byron was pissed. He immediately joined the White Citizens Council and later the KKK. We all saw that coming. Not a shocker. But like many good white boys during that time, Byron was also a very active member in his church, specifically the Greenwood Episcopal Church of the Nativity. Now, Byron was very well known in his area because Byron loved to take Christianity and mix it with white supremacy and make a fuckery of it and write letters and submit them to the local newspaper where they would publish it. Now, if you're wondering, what that looks like, let me just read you an excerpt. Quote, I shall oppose any person, place, or thing that opposes segregation. And further, when I die, I will be buried in a segregated cemetery. When you get to heaven, you will find me in the part that has a sign saying, for whites only. And if I go to Hades, I'm gonna raise hell all over Hades until I get to the white section. For the next 15 years, we here in Mississippi are gonna have to do a lot of shooting to protect our wives, children, and ourselves from bad inward. I'm not saying that. He's a lovely person, right? Yeah. No. Two years before Byron ended up murdering Medgar, he actually got word that some African Americans were going to try to attend his church. So what does Byron do? Wakes up very early, grabs his gun, goes off to church, stands at the steps of his church with his gun on his hip, ready to shoot any black person who tries to enter their worship service. As people were entering to attend worship and go to church that day, they have stated that Byron was standing there with his gun and as they would pass him, he said, you don't have anything to worry about, I'm gonna handle it. So let's recap, let's get this straight. A man is standing outside of a church before he goes inside, praise Jesus, and ready to shoot people for trying to come in and worship God. What? Now they had physical evidence when Byron ended up assassinating Medgar. They had physical evidence. They had Byron's fingerprint on the scope of the rifle that was used to murder Medgar. Medgar was prosecuted and sent to trial. Unfortunately, it was always ending in a hung jury. Twice. They took him to trial twice ending in a hung jury. If you don't know what a hung jury is, basically what that means is not everybody on the jury could come up with a unanimous guilty or a unanimous not guilty verdict. So the trial has to basically just start over with a new set of jury. But since the state had already paid to try to prosecute Byron twice and it both times ended in a hung jury, the state kind of just dropped it after that. Now why in the world would a hung jury happen when you have physical evidence right in front of you? Physical freaking evidence to prove that this man murdered another man. Well, it's simple. Once again, racism. Like we said earlier in the story, black people were heavily disenfranchised when it came to voting rights. And that is how they picked jury members was from your voting registry. So since black people weren't on the voting registry, the jury was always all white. Not only that, but also the judge in one of the trials was seen by the jury approaching Byron, shaking his hand and being very friendly with him. So basically the jury sees that as the judge being very sympathetic to Byron, even though he's on freaking trial for murder. So naturally that gives the jury a very skewed view of the judge's opinion of the case. And so it doesn't shock anyone that they came to a hung jury both times. Now Byron is a free man for years. And in these years, he ends up becoming a very prominent leader in many segregationist type organizations. He was a leader in the segregationist Phineas priesthood. 
basically what that is, is it's an offshoot of the white supremacist Christianity identity movement. Yeah, I know, mouthful. Basically, their group was known for being very hostile to not only African Americans, but Jewish people, uh, even Catholics, and basically anybody that was considered a foreigner to America. Nine years after the state tried to prosecute Byron, the FBI was informed in 1973 that Byron was actually planning on murdering somebody. He was planning on murdering a man named Botnik, and this man was actually a leader within an like anti-defamation organization. This organization was mainly there to fight against like anti-Semitism stuff, and they were there to serve like the Jewish community. But Botnik ended up making a statement towards white supremacists, and mm, Byron didn't like that. So Byron decided he's just gonna murder this guy. Well. People found out about it and they actually informed the FBI. FBI ended up surveilling Byron for a while and when he was on his way traveling to New Orleans, the New Orleans police stopped him and searched his car. In this search, they ended up finding a map leading straight to Botnik's home, multiple guns that were loaded, and even dynamite. He was ready to do some damage. He was he was promptly arrested for the conspiracy to commit murder and was actually tried and convicted on August 1st of 1975. He served a total of three years until he was paroled in 1980. The man was planning on murdering somebody. They had full proof of it. He was convicted and he saw three years. Three fucking years. What? To make this even more crazy, just before Byron was convicted, he was actually ordained by a reverend as a minister of the Temple Memorial Baptist Church. Oh, it was Baptist. Oh, well, that makes sense. Totally makes sense. Thankfully, in the 1980s, a group called the Jackson Claron League, I think is how you say it, actually ended up publishing reports because they had done an investigation. They had found that both trials back in 1964, there was evidence of jury tampering. Basically what had happened is a state agency had come in and actually done background on all the people within the pool of the jury selection and helped the judge, prosecution, whoever it was that ended up picking the jury to help pick a sympathetic jury. Basically the reasoning behind them doing this was because they wanted to save face for the state of Mississippi. Shocker, a man was murdered and they could care less. Now, when these findings came forward, Merle, Medgar's wife, ended up pressuring the authorities to reopen her husband's case. Thankfully, because of Merle's pressure on the authorities, they did end up opening like an internal investigation. They did find these sources and information and evidence of jury tampering credible and decided that they were going to retry Byron De La Beckwith Jr. for the murder of Medgar Evers. Byron was set to go to trial in January of 1994. Take that in for a second. Medgar was murdered in 1963. Byron is finally going to trial in 1994. What? Before his trial, Byron was 71 years old and tried to appeal the decision to take him back to court. Basically, Byron was saying that this all needed to be dismissed because it infringed on his constitutional rights of having a fair and speedy trial. He also stated that it violated the due process and double jeopardy. Thankfully, the Mississippi Supreme Court ruled against his appeal to dismiss the case, and he was set to go to trial in January of 1994. But it is important to note that when the Mississippi Supreme Court voted on Byron's appeal to dismiss the entire case, it only passed by a four to three vote. So the retrial almost didn't happen. Now when they went to trial, the evidence that was brought forward was pretty much the exact same evidence that was brought forward in the first two cases back in the 60s. The only thing that we had coming into this trial that was different from the first two was testimony. Byron had decided that he was some lucky dog that had gotten away with murder and that boy couldn't keep his trap shut, thank God. 
He went around for years boasting about murdering Medgar and never having to go to jail. There was testimony brought forward from people saying that he had boasted about this during many Klan rallies and other places, even boasted it to one of the cellmates when he was in prison for those three years for conspiracy to commit murder. Because of the physical evidence and the testimony, on February 5th of 1994, Byron De La Beckwith Jr. was finally convicted of the murder of Medgar Evers. Now Byron, of course, was not happy with this and tried to appeal his case to the Mississippi Supreme Court, but in 1997, the Mississippi Supreme Court upheld the conviction saying, no, you're staying in jail, you murdered someone, bucko. The court had stated that even though there was a 31 year gap between the first two hung jury trials and the third one, it didn't violate his constitutional rights to a fair and speedy trial and this was not considered double jeopardy because there was no actual like verdict from the first two trials. On January 21st of 2001, Byron De La Beckwith Jr. ended up dying in jail from a heart attack. He had struggled for years with blood pressure issues, heart issues, and other things. He ended up dying at 80 years old, but only technically spent four years in prison for the murder of Medgar Evers. Now, unfortunately, I know Medgar Evers' assassination is one of many during the times of desegregation and when white supremacy was at its height. And I know that we will just continue to learn more as we decolonize and listen and learn the real history of America. And part of learning our real history is learning the real history and the dark history behind Christianity and coming face to face with the shit that our ancestors have done. If you're deconstructing and decolonizing, I highly suggest that you get the book White Too Long and read it. I am still working my way through the book and I am sure I will come and suggest more resources as I continue to deconstruct and decolonize. So once again, I'm here at the end of the video, feeling awkward, not sure how to end it. I know this one was a little bit more on the heavy side, but I think these stories are very important for us to learn and talk about and bring recognition to and take ownership of Christianity's horrible past and understand how white supremacy has played into the history of America and still plays into the systems we have in place today. And this is just the beginning. If you like this video and you like this kind of content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. That way you do not miss any other uploads. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Drink some water, go for a walk, do a hobby, do something to just take care of yourself. I will see you next week for another video. I love each and every one of you. Have a great week. Bye.